Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Mark Harwood. I'm the main organizer of uh, the Akron Software Craftsmanship Meetup. Um, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, we try to meet once a month and discuss agnostic tech and tech adjacent topics. Uh, we usually meet on the third Thursday of every month. Um, and typically, I have a, an event 10 times a year. Uh, we'll take two months off a year, um, usually. Uh, so before we get started, I have to plug the group's main sponsor, which is Robert Half Technology, which is where I work. Um, I manage our professional service in the greater Cleveland and Pittsburgh areas, um, and that's a group of web, web app, mobile, and uh, data warehouse engineers, and we just help companies in the Midwest build software. Also, Robert Half Technology has a great local permanent placement team and a very effective contracting and contract to hire team. So if you're in the market for a new role or if you're at a company who could use some help hiring tech talent, please let me know. You can find me very easily on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, so corporate plug over. I also wanted to mention that there are two public tech oriented Slack communities in our area, the Cleveland Tech Slack and the Canton Tech Slack. So if anyone would like to join either to connect with the other greater Cleveland tech community members, um, I'm going to be dropping the invite uh, links in our Zoom chat here shortly after Blake gets started. Um, and speaking of, I'd like to introduce our presenter tonight. Uh, Blake and I have been friends for a couple of years now. He runs his own consultancy named iCompute Consulting, um, and he builds software for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, he was one of the first people I met several years ago to reference and then teach me about Go, which is Google's programming language. Um, so naturally, a couple of years later, I bugged him to do a presentation for me on it. Um, so yeah, Go is the topic of discussion for tonight. So Without any further rambling from me, Blake, please take it away. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about Go. It's it, this was originally scheduled for March of last year, and then, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, coronavirus happened, and so here we are trying to do this again in 2021. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess it's Go time. Um, the in the bottom right hand corner of the screen here, you hopefully can see a little gopher guy. And that's what we call someone who writes Go code. So if you write Go code, you're a gopher. Um, if you guys want to uh, just pop into the chat on Zoom here, how many of you have heard of Go? Just say I have or you know, smiley face or whatever if you if you have. Okay, great. So just real quick, this is about me. Uh, again, my name is Blake. Um, I have a wife and three boys, uh, zero, two, and four years old. And um, I'm a software developer, uh, really like databases. Um, really, uh, we're actually working on building our own database right now in Go, incidentally. And uh, I've looked at databases like Redis and InfluxDB and, and those sorts of things. Uh, of course, I'm also interested in, in Go and artificial intelligence, and uh, I, I put astrophysics there. I'm not really sure. Uh, I like astrophysics. Okay. Anyway, uh, about us, we're a like like Mark said, we're a small business in Hudson. Uh, we build software for software developers. Uh, we also do a lot of embedded systems and what I guess I'll call business applications, like inventory management, project management, that sort of thing. We can also offer some training services, and uh, I just kind of put our tech stack on there so you can kind of get an idea of what we work on. Um, we do a ton of Node.js stuff. Uh, we do a little bit of Go and a lot of React on the front end. So, um, yeah, give us a hire, shoot us a note, uh, or come join the team. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is basically uh, what is Go? Why do we care? <laughs> Why do we need another programming language? And then we're gonna kind of dive into Go for about 40 minutes and I'll show you some of the syntax and um, yeah, kind of get to know the language a little bit better. And then uh, we'll also talk about, you know, how can Go help our organization, you know, from a business point of view, but also from a technology point of view. Um, so 
So yeah, go as a new technology. As with all new technologies, we we like to ask, you know, how will it affect us? What will it do for us? Um, so this is a quick rundown. What is Go? Go is a general purpose programming language. So like say Java or C sharp or you know, those sorts of things. You can build anything in Go. And uh, Go can run on anything from microcontrollers to um, you know, OS X, Windows, Linux, um, all sorts of different uh, devices and so on. And it's open source and um, developed at Google. And there's a there's a nice uh, there's a nice mix being. Sorry, Blake. That was my bad. Oh, that's okay. No worries. Um, yeah, so there's this nice blend between it being open source and uh, between open source and it being powered by Google. So what I mean by that is Google's kind of left the community in charge of it, but also uh, acted as kind of like a moderator. And it's, it's just a really nice way of doing things, I think, I mean, especially when you have a project as big as that program. Um, you can see some of the stats there from GitHub. Um, it's a pretty, pretty popular uh, programming language at this point. Um, built with performance and simplicity in mind. Um, and now we're on version 1.15, uh, something like 12 years of, of Go development have occurred uh, today. Um, one thing to note is that when you have a Go program, it actually gets compiled to a standalone binary. Um, and that lends for better performance because uh, your, your program is actually uh, standalone binary. It's, it's designed for the specific architecture and operating system that you're compiling for. Uh, the compiler, the Go compiler itself is extremely fast and the standalone binaries include the Go runtime environment, which is about two megabytes. So there's no need to install um, a runtime environment like you have to do for Java or say C sharp for the .NET framework um, and those sorts of things. So in a way your, your Go executable is in its own container. And so it's containerized um, in, in that way. Uh, Go is statically typed, which is really nice um, for catching a lot of bugs at compile time, among other things. Um, I feel like type safety is really important, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. And Go shares a, a C-like syntax. So if you're, if you're familiar with C, um, you'd be pretty familiar with uh, the Go syntax. A lot of constructs, uh, including structs and stuff like that, are shared between uh, C and Go. And um, yeah, it just kind of makes Go a very simple, fast language. Um, one difference where it deviates from C and C++ is that Go is garbage collected. And there's a uh, tiny amount of performance that's sacrificed there for a large amount of safety, in terms of memory safety and uh, stability in your program. Um, and the, uh, the Go garbage collector is you know, really well engineered. You can read some blog posts on the internet about it, but it's extremely fast and extremely low latency. Um, which is nice for building very large systems. Um, what else? Uh, I put some other things here. Go features an interface system and some con con uh, concurrency constructs and a package system, which we'll all get to. And then it also offers some modern functional programming paradigms like closures and, and some other things. And I just threw on here just a few things that have been written in Go, um, some popular projects and some companies that are using Go. Um, Paddy, if you haven't heard of Paddy, it's a, it's a fantastic web server. Um, if you're familiar with Apache or Nginx or, or one of those web servers, um, you know, those are nice. Paddy takes it to a different level. And if you haven't, uh, if you haven't checked it out, I would recommend doing that great project. 
Uh, Docker, if you don't know about Docker, you can check out Docker as well. Um, that's also written in Go. Um, Ethereum, Grafana. Grafana is a nice uh, charting platform. Um, I would check them out as well. They, they have some nice free tools for developers and, and building nice looking dashboards and things like that. Gogs is a self-hosted Git repository uh, written in Go. InfluxDB, which I mentioned um, in one of the previous slides, uh, is a database written in Go. It's pretty nice for time series type data. And then, you know, there are others. Um, sync thing, if you haven't uh, heard of sync thing, that's another neat little tool for synchronizing files without using the cloud. Um, so all sorts of neat like little tools there that you may or may not have heard of written in Go. And then of course I have listed some companies that uh, that use Go. Um, in China, uh, Go is extremely popular, um, and the language itself is growing in popularity. Uh, number three most wanted, I think I put here. In, I have an old Stack Overflow survey, but uh, it's 2017 and 2018. It uh, was among the top five most loved programming languages. I don't really know what that means, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's up there. So, so that's good. It's, it's becoming popular. That's great. But why? Why go? Why do we care? Um, so I think I've outlined a few things here, but there might be more things that maybe I missed. I think the most important thing about go is that there's this um, priority on simplicity and uh, one way of doing things and building uh, maintainable code that is robust that you can change over time. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the syntax and stuff later, but um, in terms of simplicity, you're going to see that Go has a very familiar syntax. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it steals a lot of really I would say the best concepts of object-oriented programming are in Go, and then maybe the not so nice things are left out. Um, Go features interfaces, which are uh, pretty unique for Go, and we'll talk about those as well. There's also this priority over readability, over writability. Um, I mean, it's great to be able to write code quickly, but ultimately, you read code more often than you write. And um, even if that means that you yourself are reading your own code, uh, readability is still very important. Uh, but generally, uh, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone here, but you know, you're working on a team, uh, there's multiple people contributing, and so readability becomes really much more important than writability, which I think is a, a uh, thing that Go tries to really drive home. Um, and there's a standard way to write Go code um, in other words, there's a standard way of formatting Go code, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but there's a uh, tool called GoFumpt, or uh, GoFMT, which formats your code automatically. And this is part of the standard tooling that you get as a developer. Um, so there's really no argument about how to format code. You know, do I put a semicolon here or not, curly brace here or not? Um, all those decisions have been kind of taken away from you. And that just means less thinking. Statically typed, uh, I mentioned this before. Um, this is really a lot about just catching errors at compile time instead of runtime. And, um, you know, runtime run errors are really not fun. They're usually emergencies. And no one really wants to be, you know, woken up in the middle of the night with their application crash or whatever. Um, so catching errors at compile time is generally a good thing. But there's also a lot of compile time optimizations uh, that you can that you can do because things are statically typed. You can save CPU cycles and uh, you can reduce your uh, RAM footprint and things like that. So there's definitely a performance benefit for static typing. And um, yeah, I don't, the other thing that I'll mention is that since Go is compiled. Um, Go runs on your target machine hardware. And the Go compiler also allows you to cross compile. Um, so not only do you get near native performance and great portability because you have these small uh, binaries, 
you also have the ability to cross compile. So I can compile a Windows program on my Linux computer or on my Mac computer, I could compile a Linux program or a program for an ARM processor. So this is like really nice um, uh, functionality because since it is a compiled language, um, oftentimes you need to compile for multiple architectures and operating systems and things. And Go allows you to do that with incredible ease. And of course, there's a great community and things like that. Um, and I, I can talk more about that in a little bit as well. Um, so ultimately what this means is that we have a faster deployment and development cycle, which um, you know, in terms of iter iterative development, the faster you can speed up that cycle, the better off you are. Um, your applications are just that are performing because Go is compiled and very close to the hardware uh, you get in your native performance. Fewer runtime errors, again, because of it being uh, aesthetically typed and probably we'll some little stuff later. Um, yeah, just less downtime, fewer emergencies, uh, more robust, more agile, which means basically it's easier to change later, very readable. Uh, I put here low cost of ownership. Um, and then ultimately you just have happier and lazier developers, which I think is great. Um, obviously, you want there to be as little friction as possible when developing software so that you can focus on business logic and um, get things done quickly. And then, like I said, the Go community has this, this interesting culture that kind of fosters developer growth. It pushes developers to the limits to um, kind of stick to the guidelines and um, uh, kind of encourage people to become better developers, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, any questions so far? If, if you have any questions, feel free to just throw them into the chat um, as we go through these slides and stuff. Uh, sometimes it's hard for me to tell because I don't see any of these faces, like if I'm losing anybody, but hopefully these examples are pretty clear cut. And uh, if you have any questions as the presentation goes on, feel free to just ask in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, feel free to do that. How big is the community on packages? Um, pretty large. Uh, one of the things that Go was lacking for a long time was kind of a central package repository. Um, in in Node.js, the, the package manager is NPM, um, which stands for Node Package Manager. Um, and of course, there's thousands upon thousands of packages. Um, there are all sorts of packages for Go, um, and it's it's growing very rapidly. Um, and I can talk about that maybe a little bit more toward the end of the, the slide deck. So just uh, in about 40 minutes here, we're just going to go through some of the highlights of the language and um, kind of give you a taste of what Go looks like. Uh, I'll talk about installing it. Uh, basically, just go to these links. Um, if you have Windows 7 or later, you're good. With Mac OS X uh, 10, 10.12 or later, you're good. And then Linux 2.6 or later. Um, here's, a, here's the first sample program that we'll talk about briefly. So you'll notice that the syntax kind of looks a little bit like C and maybe Python a little bit. Um, there's no semicolons. Um, the first line in the program indicates what package this file is a part of. Um, so this is in the package main, which indicates that this is a main program. Every program in main has a main function. So there's our main function at the bottom. And so main is the first, uh, is kind of the entry point into your application. Um, this import statement, pumpt. Uh, pumpt is a built-in package in Go. And that's how we're able to call pumps.printline. There's no header files like you see in C. Um, and the other thing I should mention is Go is passed by value. So when we call this function add, we're actually copying the values 42 and 13 as X and Y. 
So, um, yeah, basically, uh, to run this program, you would just type in go and then run. And then the name of your go source file, which is in this case is 00 add go. And then go is going to go, is, uh, going to go ahead and compile and then run your program. And so the output of this program is 55. And then this would be an example of uh, building your program. You just type in go build and then the name of your source file. And by default, it's going to generate an executable with the same name, uh, dropping the .go extension. And then you just run that and it outputs uh, the, uh, the answer for it. So this is just quick and dirty uh, sample program here. Here's another one. Uh, here's hello world. Uh, so we have a function here called swap. It takes in parameters X and Y and then returns two parameters. Um, in the previous function, we, we had two parameters and returned one um, value, which is an int. In this case, we're, we have two strings that are going in and two strings that are going out. Um, so you can see that this just swaps these two strings. Um, so if we, run this, if we run this program, we start out with A and B. So after we run swap, A will be equal to hello and B will be equal to world. And so when we call flimps.printline, we just get hello. And then here's a quick uh, little example with some control flow. So um, <clears throat> you, you'll notice in the previous example, A and B, we declared uh, var as variables. So var A comma B string, that's just basically saying, okay, we have two variables A and B and they're both of type string. Um, another way to declare and initialize a variable is to just use this colon equals. Um, so you can see here sum colon equals zero. <coughs> and this just basically tells Go, okay, uh, infer the type of sum based on the right hand side of the input sign. So since zero is an int, sum becomes a, uh, a variable of type int. Then we have a for loop. Um, notice there's no parentheses around uh, the for loop. It's just uh, you know the word for and then a space and then your, your initialization, condition, and post increment options. All all of which are optional, by the way. And then it follows with a, a curly brace, which are uh, required. The curly braces are mandatory. Um, so this is a uh, pretty simple for loop. It's basically just setting i equal to one and going until i, is, you know, so long as i is less than ten, we we increment. So some some in this case would just become the number forty-five. Um, <clears throat> and then yeah, you can see that when we flip to that print line, well, we got to forty-five. Um, then the next loop is what I call a for range loop or a range for loop. I'm not really sure exactly. It's a for loop with a range clause. And what this is doing is defining an array of ints. So you can see the array of ints there called two powers. And again, because we didn't specify the type of two powers, the type is inferred from the right hand side. So this is declaring a new variable called two powers, and it is of type uh, slice of int. I'll talk about slices here on the next slide. I think. Um, but it's just, it's an essentially a dynamically expanding array or a vector if you're from uh, if you're familiar with C, an array list if you're familiar with uh, Java. I think it might even be called array list in C sharp. And yeah, here's just all of our two powers. So what we can do is we can write a for loop, basically just as i, which is our index, and then val, which is the value at that index, and iterate through our two powers array. 
And so this is just saying if val is greater than 50, then break. So we started printing out um, all the two powers. The, the one thing that I should notice is that this may be familiar for some people who are familiar with C or whatever, um, but here's printf. Printf is just a special printing function <clears throat> that supports things like this percent %d. Um, percent %d stands for digit or number. So in this case, um, those percent %d's are going to be substituted with the actual values of i and val. If you can see that <clears throat> in the output of the program, you end up at two star star zero, which is the value of i, and then equals and then one, which is the value of <clears throat> val at that degree. Any questions on any of this so far? Thumbs up if you're following me. I don't know. All right, so I talked about Go being statically typed. <clears throat> and um, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Um, so of course we have to talk about types. These are all the primitive types built into Go. <clears throat> um, notice string is a part of this list. Um, C does not have strings as primitive types. You have uh, arrays of chars, or char arrays, whatever you want to call them. Um, so that's really annoying. In Go, string is a built-in primitive type. And as we'll find out later, strings really are just immutable uh, byte slices. In Go. Um, we have uint, uint 8, uint 16, uint 32, uint 64. Those just represent the number of bits um, that are in those integer values. So a uint 8 is one byte or eight bits. A uint 64 is eight bytes or 64 bit integer. And the U in front just means unsigned. So you either have an unsigned int or a signed int. Um, and if, you're, if anyone's familiar with type languages, you'll understand what that is. Um, if not, basically, this, these are just different uh, sizes of numbers that you're allowed to have. Um, so uint 8, for example, can hold a value between 0 and 255. Um, because that's the largest number that you can have in an 8-bit integer. Uh, similarly, you have uh, float floating point numbers, uh, both a float 32 and a float 64. Again, a float 64 is 8 bytes, a float 32 is 4 bytes, and this just determines the, the size of the floating point number that you're able to um, store in that variable. Go also has complex numbers um, as a built-in type, which is interesting. Um, and then we also have a, uh, a byte, which is an alias for uint8, and a rune, which is an alias for int32. And a rune in Go represents a Unicode code point, uh, which takes four bytes of memory to represent. Then we also have these composite types. Um, in Go, Go also has pointers. So if, they're, if you're familiar with uh, pointers in C, they, they work almost the same way in Go, except the pointer values themselves are immutable. And what I mean by that is um, there's no pointer arithmetic in Go. Um, Go is uh, memory safe, um, so you can't do any craziness uh, with the pointers in Go. They're a lot more like references um, that you find in maybe other versions, maybe like maybe Java or something. Uh, Go also has structs, which are a lot like objects. These are pretty much equivalent to C structs, but in case you're not familiar, it's basically just a bunch of um, fields. So this struct has a name field, which is a type string, and an age field, which is a type name. Uh, functions. So um, Functions are first class types in Go. So a variable can store a function and you can pass them around. Um, so you can, you can pass around callbacks and things like that in Go. Um, in C, you can do something similar with the, with the void pointer. 
Um, but in Go, this is this is all memory safe, so funky is a first class citizen. Going back to pointers for a second, I just wanted to mention that since Go is garbage collected, um, you can have pointers to local variables on the stack, and that's totally fine. Um, so you can actually have a function that returns a pointer to a local variable. That is that is uh, totally safe to do in Go, maybe even in Perl. Um, all right, so continuing here, uh, we have arrays. These are not used very often because the length must be known at compile time, and that's rarely the case. In most applications, uh, you're going to be using slices. And I, I threw around the word slice a few times, but basically this is a dynamic, dynamically expanding array. Um, this would be like the array list in Java. And every slice has a certain memory capacity and a certain length, which we'll talk about later. Um, Go also has a built-in map type, um, which is kind of like a, a hash table sort of data structure. Um, there's also channels, which allow you to communicate between Go routines. We'll, we'll take a look at what those are. And finally, the interface type, which is kind of like a variant in Visual Basic. If you're familiar with DB. It's like a variant type. Um, it's sort of like anything can be stored in, in an interface type as long as it implements the methods that are listed. So we talked, um, basically what this is saying is that this variable has to implement this, this particular uh, contract, these methods. So in this case, I'm showing you an example of a interface that has to have a read method with this signature. So it has to accept a a byte slice, and, and it has to return um, an integer and an error. Um, this means that a variable of type empty interface or interface with two curly braces can be assigned any underlining type um, because there's no methods that it has to fulfill. So this is more like uh, a variant type. So even though Go is statically typed, you also have the flexibility of having uh, of variables that can store any type. And that's that's what the interface type uh, allows you to do. Um, and this plays a key role in reflection and polymorphism, which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, when we get more off the um, One other thing that I wanted to mention, and this kind of goes along with type safety, or excuse me, memory safety in Go, is that whenever you declare a variable, it is always assigned what's called the zero value in Go. So here I'm just declaring a bunch of variables, an integer, a float64, a bool, a string, uh, a slice of ints, a pointer to an int, an empty interface, and an array of 10 elements of 10 integers. And you'll notice that when I print these out, when I call uh, punch.printf, this is essentially just going to print out the zero value. And what I mean by zero value is for an integer, I mean literally the number zero. For flow 64, I mean zero. For bool, I mean the value false. For string, the zero value is an empty string. And for a uh, slice of integers, it's just an empty uh, slice. For a pointer to an int, it's the value nil, which is the nil pointer. And for an empty interface that has not been assigned a value, that's also going to be nil. And finally, for our array of 10 ints, um, it's literally going to allocate an array of 10 zeros. So this basically means that uh, when you declare a variable in C, for example, uh, it's uninitialized. It, it could be random data from memory. Go is memory safe, so it, you know when you as soon as you declare something, it is initialized with the zero value right away. Um, so zero values are actually quite useful, and uh, we'll see that a little bit more later if, as things are left uninitialized. Here's an example of <coughs> slices, um, a little bit heavier example. So here I've declared a variable s which is an empty slice of ints. So this 
So S is initialized to the zero value, which is an empty slice. And so when we print it out, we should get an empty slice. And you can notice my, my, my print slice uh, function just simply prints out the contents of the uh, slice. And it, but before it prints out the contents, it prints out, prints out the length and the capacity of our slice. Um, so you can see I'm calling this function len and cap on the very second to last line there. Len and cap are built-in functions in Go um, that allow you to check the length and the capacity of a slice. You can also use len to check the, to check the length of a string. So these are kind of, uh, uh, can be used for multiple data types. You can use len on a string or on a slice. Um, here, len is being used on a slice. <clears throat> so when we print it out initially, we get an empty slice as expected. There's also a built-in function called append, which takes, takes it, a slice as a parameter and then one or more elements that you want to append to the slice. And then that returns a new slice, which then we can print. So um, yeah, as we append 0, 0 gets added. When we append 1, 1 gets added. And when we append 2, 3, and 4, now we have, uh, we, can, we can add more than one element at a time um, because append is a variadic function, which means it, it accepts multiple arguments. And you can write your own variable functions and go. It's not just the build things, um, like ten. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically how slices work. So this is a way that you can uh, grow your slice dynamically and add things to it over time. Slices are really three different things. They're <clears throat> they're a length, a pointer to an underlying array, and a capacity. Um, you can kind of see that demonstrated here. Um, and like I said, len, cap, and append are three of the 13 Go built-in functions. Um, append, what, it, what it's actually doing under the hood is copying the array. And if the capacity was exceeded, then it allocates a new array. Um, so append could potentially return a new slice, but not necessarily only if the slice itself grows in size. What's the reason that the capacity in the last case is six? That is a great question. So in Go, whenever you call the append function, um, append is going to generally double the slice's capacity. And the reason for that is um, the same reason why array lists grow by doubling. And that is to ensure that if you were in a for loop constantly appending something, you wouldn't want to reallocate a whole new array, and copy the whole array every time just to add one new spot to store something. So when, when we added two, three, and four, it allocated um, six integers in memory, but it's only storing data in five of those. Um, but there's six spaces available. So if we called append one more time, it would not need to allocate a new array. So cap is representing how much memory it is allocated, whereas len is telling you how many items are in that array, if that makes sense. So generally as a programmer, you're more concerned with len, but cap is representing how much uh, memory is and does len define what's accessible? So like there mm -hmm. isn't like a six nil element in that last case that you can access. You can only access the five mm -hmm. things that are defined. That is a great question. That is correct. You can only okay. access what len will allow you to access. I believe that is the case. I could be wrong. It is possible that you can access the sixth one, but I don't think that that's true. I'm pretty sure that len is what limits you to access. Yeah, that's a great question. 
So the idea here is that if the array doubles each time you call append, uh, or each time you run out of capacity, then you can get what's called amortized um, constant time on the append function. In other words, even though in some time, sometimes append has to reallocate the array and double it and do all this copying and all this extra work, um, over the course of a for loop, over a long period of time, append runs in amortized constant time. And so big old of, uh, of one, if that makes sense. <clears throat> In, in other words, it's fast. <laughs> it makes it fast. Um, any other questions on slices? These are essentially dynamically expanding arrays. Is there a way to force your slice to have the same capacity as your length? So for example, in your last case, if this, you know, if this was thousands of of elements and the capacity was twice that, is there a way to force it to only allocate as much as it's needed? Yes. So there is a way to make a slice a particular capacity and a particular length in advance. So if you knew, for example, um, that you needed to allocate say a thousand items or a thousand inks for whatever reason, you could do that ahead of time. Um, you could also allocate, you could also force the length to be zero and capacity to be very large, or you can set the length to a particular value and it'll initialize it with zeros automatically. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, moving on to maybe a little bit more of an object-oriented type example. This is a struct um, and the, there's a keyword in Go for defining new types. This is a named type called a person. And we're just going to create that type and it's going to be of type struct. So this is a type and we're calling it person, but the underlying type is a struct. And the struct has three fields. Um, in Go, I should mention that if something starts with a capital letter, then it's exported, it's public to other packages. If something starts with a lowercase letter, it's, it's uh, private to that particular package. But this particular struct has three fields, first name, last name, and birthday. And first name is of type string, last name of, is of type string, and then birthday is of type time.com. And the time package in Go defines a uh, time.time struct, which represents an infinite in time. So um, this, this type that I've created called person also has two methods to it. So this is the way that you define methods in Go um, to make it feel a little bit more object oriented. <clears throat> and methods in Go could, are also known as receiver functions. So they receive the type to which they're associated. So in this case, we have a func key person full name. So what this is saying is that this function should be attached to a person type. Um, and that type happens to be a struct in this case. And the name of the method is full name. And it takes no arguments, but it returns a string. So you can see in this case, we're just returning key.first name plus space plus p.last. And then we also have another method called string, which also returns a string. This is just going to say return p.full name was born on, and then p.birthday.format, which is formatting that date according to uh, you know, month, day, year sort of format. So here we go. We, in our main function, we create a new person. Um, is me and then put in a new time.date and then I can call me.full name and print out my name. Notice in the receiver functions there's no uh, this keyword like you see in other languages. Um, it's very explicit of what's happening here. Instead of this we actually have p 
which is the name that I gave it as the person who wrote the method. Um, and so it's very clear what P is. In, in some other or object-oriented languages that use the this keyword, it can be sometimes unclear what, what this refers to. Uh, in Go, it's very obvious and very explicit. Um, so this allows you to uh, create a person and call up public methods. The other thing that I'll mention is on the very last line, print.println, and you pass me in there. What's actually happening is the string method is being called. And the reason why that is is because print.println, when it prints out individual objects, it's looking for uh, objects that implement the stringer interface. And I'll talk about that more uh, on the next couple slides here. But basically what that means is it's looking for a string method. And if it finds a string method, it's going to call it. And so that's why um, our program outputs my name, and then it outputs my name and says, was born on June 7. Yeah, so one thing that's a little bit weird here for, for me and for other people is the, uh, the time that time format function that's passed in, you know, kind of a string that's, that looks like January 2, 2006. Um, Go does some magic there to figure out uh, what that string actually means. Uh, instead of other languages, which kind of use this mm, dd, comma, y, 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 y for month, date, year, um, uh, it, it uses, um, you know, this sort of thing. So this was just a design choice that Go, that the Go standard library has made for uh, the date, the time dot time pattern. So yeah, that's that's why it looks a little strange. I think January second, two thousand six, might have been the time that uh, the Go standard library was kind of created. You can also pass in um, uh, the ISO eighty six zero one uh, constant. You can you can read all about this in the time that time in the time package itself. But there's a uh, a special constant for passing in uh, standard formats like ISO eighty six zero one. Quick question about the order of function declarations. Yeah. Could full name be declared after string or not because it uses full name? Yeah, it can be declared after. Okay. Yeah, the order of method declarations doesn't matter. In fact, the order of all function declarations doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah good question. Yeah, C, C unfortunately is not as forgiving. <laughs> what would the, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. The last line where you're printing, um, if it doesn't find a, a function called string, what does it print? Yeah, what it would do instead is it would print out um, the different fields in the struct. So function.println uses uh, some magic behind the hood, which is called reflection. And in Go, because of the empty interface type, you can um, you can get some information about the underlying type at runtime and print some stuff about it. So it would have just printed uh, Blake and Minor and then probably uh, an ISO 8601 date um, in the final instead of the you know full name was born on that sort of thing. It would just literally print out each field in the struct one at a time. Uh, hey, Blake, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this question uh, and I got caught up in the excitement of having the same birthday. Um, yeah. <laughs> could you elaborate on how dates are formatted in Go, specifically the January 2nd, 2006? Did you answer that? Yeah, I touched on it briefly, oh, but basically, okay. yeah, Go is, Go is trying to uh, provide a more human readable way of formatting dates as opposed to, you know, the Y, 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 and then whatever. It's hard to remember, you know, is M minutes or is M month? You know, is S seconds or, you know, all sorts of like weird oddities. 
Um, okay, my indentation got broken. Here. Okay. So in Go, there are um, interfaces called reader and writer. And this is where we'll kind of talk about interfaces and hopefully you guys will kind of have some more questions and stuff. But basically, as long as you implement these methods um, in this exact syntax, you are a reader. You implement the reader interface. Uh, and similarly, if you implement the write function, um, as long as you take a byte slice and return an int and an error, you have implemented the writer interface. And if you've implemented those interfaces, then you can be passed to this copy function, which takes a writer and a reader and returns an error of byte slice. So in, the reason why I talk about this is because in the OS package, a file um, implements read and write. But a, fi a file itself doesn't explicitly implement these interfaces. In other words, there's no code that says, um, you know, this particular file is a class that implements uh, io.reader. There's no reference to io.reader in the OS package at all. The only thing that the OS package cares about is that the file actually has these read and write methods. So what I'm getting at here is that file happens to implement reader and write, but it's not explicit about it. So even though it's not explicit about it, you can still uh, use a file as a uh, destination source in the io.copy. So th there's this decoupling that's happening here, where IO, the io package has no idea about the OS package and what a file even is. It doesn't care. It just is declaring this reader and writer interface, and it's also declaring this copy function. And similarly, the OS package has no idea about io.reader and io.writer. It also has no idea about io.copy. All that it cares about is that this file has this read method and it has this write now, despite that decoupling, you can do some interesting things. You can literally open a file and then copy the contents from the file to standard out using the standard io.copy function. So that's what you're seeing here in this example. Uh, the first thing that we do is we open up a file and os.open, um, as you may or may not have seen in this last slide, returns a pointer to a file and an error. And if the error is nil, then we assume everything's fine. So the first thing we check is we say, okay, well, if the error is not nil, then we have a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to say um, print line, you know, print error opening file to standard A. And then we'll call os.exit1, which is Going to give our program on uh, exit flag as one and, and, and close our program. If there was no error, then we're good to go. We just continue on to the next line, which is defer f.close, which is basically saying when main is done running, we're going to close this file. And I'll talk about the defer keyword a little bit more later. Uh, but basically, defer is saying run this function at the end of. The current function. So defer doing this until the end. So one thing that's nice about using defer at this point is that now that we've deferred closing the file, we don't have to worry about closing the file later. In other words, we, we kind of open the file, and if successful, then we intend to close the file. Later. So that's what this defer statement is doing. And this is really handy for cleaning up resources and things like that. Okay, so then the very next line is we copy the file contents to standard out. And remember, io.copy takes in a writer as the first argument and a reader as the second argument. 
and returns the number of bytes written and an error if an error occurs. So this is literally just read from the reader and write it to the writer. So you can imagine copy has maybe some sort of buffer and it's reading from F and copying and writing to standard F. Um, yeah, and then as long as there's no error, uh, we print out success. Now, the interesting thing is that os.standardout has a write function, has a write method, but again, it doesn't explicitly implement the writer interface. And, and f also has a read function, but it also doesn't explicitly implement the reader interface. Yet this all still compiles and works fine. When the so compiler determines if uh, interface is implemented, do the names of the parameters and return values matter or just the types? Um, could you ask that again? I'm sorry. When, when the compiler is determining if something implements an interface, is it just the, the types of the parameters and the return values that have to match or did the yeah. names also matter? Just the types. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, and of course the method name. Right, yep. Yep. So as long as you uh, have the right method signature, you're good to go. And that does not include the parameter name. Yeah, good point. It does include the return values though. Um, so, or just the types of the return values. So as long as it's a read function that takes a byte slice and returns an int, followed by an error, you're good to go. So this is all happening at compile time. What's actually happening is that, um, remember, reader is of type interface. So copy takes in a writer interface type and a reader interface type. Doesn't matter what the actual variable is. In this case, um, you know, one of the variables happens to be a file, a, a type file. But at compile time, it figures out, okay, type file does implement the reader interface and it keeps a memory, uh, it keeps kind of like memory address of the read uh, function of the read method of F in this case. And then it's able to call that function at runtime, um, you know, very quickly. I, I would love to dive into how that works, but I'm afraid that it might be a little too outside the scope of this. But interface types are really neat. Um, here's another uh, example of uh, some object-oriented code. This is kind of demonstrating composition versus inheritance. And um, Go does not implement inheritance at all, but you can compose structures together to get something that kind of feels like inheritance. Um, but it's, it's really not. The problem with inheritance is that you inherit everything. You inherit uh, the properties and all of the methods and everything. Whereas with, with um, composition, it's generally more robust. For example, you have a rocket. A rocket has the ability to fly and a bird has the ability to fly. But, um, you know, like an example of inheritance would be, you know, a duck is a bird. So a duck and parrots from bird, but a bird can fly, so can a duck. But what about a, what about a chicken? A chicken is a bird, but it can't fly. So it's, it's kind of like this weird um, thing where when you inherit some some methods and you inherit some uh, some fields, um, there are some methods that don't make sense necessarily. With composition, uh, it's a little bit simpler. So in this case, you'll notice there's a line in the uh, in the string function where it says p dot full name, and even though the post doesn't have a full name method explicitly specified, it is inherited from author. If that makes any sense. Um, that's the key thing to highlight there is that p dot full name in the string method. You can call p.fullName and it will compile because um, it's, it's borrowing that full name function from author, 
not from the post. Anyway, I'll move on past this. Uh, Go also has a lot of really nice concurrency uh, things. If anyone's done multi-threaded application development, you kind of maybe know that that's a nightmare. <laughs> it's not a good time. Um, event loops are pretty great. Uh, in languages like Node.js, you don't have to worry about concurrency because the event loop kind of hides it from you. And um, Go offers somewhat of a compromise between these two, which are called Go routines. And um, you can think of them as really lightweight threads. So here's an example. Um, what we have here are is a Go routine. Um, and we well, let, let's just start in this main function. So first thing that we do is we make two channels. And a channel is something that we can send data to or receive data from. It's kind of like, you can think of it like a, a queue. So values is a channel of type int and done is a channel of type bool. And we use the built-in function make to make these things. So the first thing that we do is we start the printer go routine. It basically says when you say go printer, it means call this function, but then let it run in a separate thread or in a lightweight thread called a go routine. So we have another go routine that's just constantly running this printer function. Then we wait three seconds. And then the next thing we do is we start our producer. So we run that in a separate thread. And then the very last thing that we do is we read from the done channel. And this read will block until it receives some data from the done channel. So whenever you read from a channel, um, your program is going to block. So what does this do? Basically, printer starts um, by reading from the input channel. And again, until something is able to be read, it's going to block. And um, it's going to continue to read from input indefinitely until that channel is closed. And then as we read from the channel, we get a value. This is a four range loop. So this is a four range loop on the channel. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just val is going to be of type int. And so this is going to literally print out those ints and then wait um, 500 milliseconds and then try to read again. Our producer, on the other hand, is just simply going to produce numbers um, one through num, which in this case is 10. And um, it's going to write those numbers to the output channel. So output is also a type int, and that's our values channel that we have. And then when we're done writing all 10 numbers, we're going to close the output channel. So the output of this program is essentially just going to be the numbers 1 through 10. And it's going to print one every half a second. Um, and there are three different threads running in this program, or three likely threads. So I mean, I'll, I'll leave this up for the screen for a little bit for everyone to kind of think about this a little bit. But. Uh, while you're looking at this, think about how you would write this program using threads. And then think about, you know, how would you write this program in Java or in C Sharp or something? It's pretty difficult. Here's another example of concurrency. Um, I don't want to dive into this program too much, but this is a, the nth function is a function that computes the nth prime using what I'm calling a, uh, a filter process that's daisy chained together. And the filter function filters out uh, the composite numbers in a concurrent way. So this is a prime number generator. And rather than using a sieve, something like that. Uh, this is actually concurrently um, using, you know, multiple 
CPU cores on your computer, um, filtering out composite numbers and leaving you with only prime numbers. And then what it's going to do is it's going to print out the nth prime. So this is just broken up into two, two or three main pieces here. The function SEQ or sequence generates the sequence 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, blah, blah, blah. Just the uh, monotonically increasing list of integers, starting with two. So the channel that you pass in is going to get the number two, then it's going to get the number three, then four, then five, and so on. And this program, this, this particular Go routine is just going to run forever. So, because um, this for loop has no condition, it's just going to keep writing forever. So what we do is we, in our int function, we make a channel that has, uh, <clears throat> just ignore that 10 that's on there. This is just a performance improvement. But basically it's uh, allowing this thing to be populated with 10 things before it blocks. Then we have our sequence thing, just generating numbers and writing it to C8, a channel. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna read from CH and we're going to assume that anytime we read from CH, we're going to get a prime number. And so what we're gonna do is, as soon as we read that prime number, we're gonna create a new filter. And that filter is just gonna remove all numbers that are divisible by that particular number. So the first number that we're gonna read from the channel is gonna be the number two. And so we're gonna create a filter that just eliminates all of the numbers that are divisible by two. And then the next number that we're gonna read is the number three. And so we're gonna create a filter that eliminates all the numbers that are divisible by three. And then the next number that we'll read is five. We won't read four because the, the two filter filtered it out. So the next number we'll read is five. And we'll generate a filter that eliminates all the fives. We won't read six because the two filter eliminated that one. The next number we'll read is seven. You can see that we're going to only read prime numbers from CH because CH keeps getting replaced by our output channel. So you can think about the memory advantages that this parallel program has over um, a conventional sieve, which would, which would be used to filter out primes. But you can also think about how this program is concurrently filtering out composite numbers. And this is a pretty complicated program and just, you know, maybe a hundred lines of code, tops, 50 lines. How would you do this using threads? You know? um, and then lastly, um, the code that you saw on the last slide is actually available on GitHub. You can check it out here. It's github.com, d minor slash go primer slash primes. And because it's out there on GitHub, I can write a program that just imports that. So this is a way to import uh, other people's packages. And when I when I run go run on this program, it will automatically go and find the latest source code, compile and run the program. And then the next time I go to run the program, the go run routine will have cached that dependency in a special place on your computer. <laughs> and so it won't have to get it each time. It'll just run. But yeah, this just computes the 1 million prime number. And this, this runs on my computer in just a few seconds. So that's how you can use a package in Go or uh, another package. Notice I'm referring to the package by the last part of its name, which is prime. You can point to any Git repository as long as it's public. As long as the program that you're, as long as wherever you're compiling or wherever you're compiling from can download this, can access this particular repository, you're good to go. So it can be pointed to the self hosted Git server. So we talked about packages, modules. There's a lot more to talk about, type assertions, type switches. Uh, we kind of touched on the defer statement briefly. Um, 
kind of touched on error handling a little bit, but there's more to it there. Uh, we didn't dive into reflection at all very much. Um, kind of talked about IO and networking a little bit. Uh, Go has a rich HTTP uh, standard library. Um, logging is there, database connections are there. Um, and there's lots to talk about about Go idioms and, and different conventions in the language. Um, but those are probably outside the scope of this presentation. As far as documentation goes, um, you know, all of the code um, in the standard library is documented, obviously, and that's on golang.org. So you can go there and look at the standard library. Here's the, uh, the FUMPT package. Um, we were doing a lot of FUMPT.printline type stuff. You can read all about the FUMPT package and, and how all those functions work. On the right-hand side is godoc.org, uh, pointed to that uh, primes package that I was showing you guys. Um, this document this, that you see on the right-hand side was literally generated automatically from the source code. Um, so there's a, a standard way of um, putting comments in your source code to um, generate you know, these nice documents. And it's not complicated. You don't have to memorize any like weird Java doc type syntax or anything weird. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, just a quick trivia question. Anyone know uh, what language the Go compiler was written in? Someone said C. It's a great guess. Uh, Michael knows. Yeah, it's written in Go. Because why, why wouldn't you write Go in Go? Um, the original compiler was written in C, of course. Um, maybe even C++. I'm not sure exactly what it is in C. Uh, just to kind of summarize things real quick, how can Go help me? Higher performance. Uh, it makes it harder to make mistakes due to the memory safety and garbage collection. Uh, type checking, of course, it being statically typed is great. And yet, even though it has the C performance, um, you know, you can still you still have access to modern features, closures, um, this whole interface idea. You can still write object-oriented code, a nice package system, um, nice ways of doing I/O, and so on. Uh, I think that it's pretty readable, um, and a lot of the concurrency patterns are extremely robust, and it allows you to just spend more time on your application logic. I mentioned uh, there are simple ways to lint code and format code, um, generate documentation, execute tests. Um, Go test is built in. There's even a benchmark handler uh, that's built in. So testing and benchmarking um, is already built into the language. So you don't have to really think about, oh, well, which unit test you know, library should I download? No, there's, there's no unit test library. It's the Go test uh, utility. So there's a there's there's one way of doing testing in Go of, of doing like unit testing. Um, yeah, is Go better than any other language ever? Um, that's a that's a question that's still out there. Definitely, it's better than COBOL then. So that's a good thing. And um, should you write your next killer app in Go? I think the question you have to ask yourself is high performance and high reliability important. How about scalability? Um, a lot of parallelism. Are you developing for an embedded system? And do you need a lot of ease in your development? I think if the answers to these are yes, or a few, a few of them are yes, then Go could be a really good uh, language for you. And lastly, I just wanted to point out some more resources that you can go. If you want to learn more about Go, if you want to become a gopher yourself, um, I strongly recommend the tour. I think someone might have even posted that in the chat. Uh, the Go tour is pretty great. You can go through there and it kind of walks you through the language um, one step at a time. There's also a document which is not for the faint of heart called Effective Go, but um, it's pretty comprehensive. So it answers a lot of questions about Go and uh, uh, really gets into some more nitty gritty details and how to write good Go code. And then, of course, I have some uh, YouTube videos of, uh, of Rob Pikecock, which I really enjoy. This whole concurrency is not parallelism video is great. Um, there's some links here about interfaces and kind of like diving into it. 
And then I, I chose uh, one more thing at the bottom here, you know, why American Express chose Go. And it's kind of like their, uh, you know, like their little white people. Kind of talking about it a little bit. Yeah, and of course there's a bunch of books and things that you can find that are out there, all sorts of resources. The last thing I will put, Mark or I will, uh, on the meetup page at some point, put a link to this presentation. And I'll also include a GitHub repository to all the source code that you can see in this uh, presentation um, so that you can you know, play around with it if you want. Yeah, so that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions or uh, thoughts or feedback or whatever, um, feel free to either put them in the chat or uh, take yourself off of mute and give me a call. Um, Blake, what's something that you wish Go did a little bit better or, or like a uh, change or improvement that you're hoping for in um, like an upcoming version or update? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Go does not have generics built in. Um, and uh, that's something that they're really working hard on uh, incorporating into the language. Um, <clears throat> Even though Go has interfaces, which allows you to build um, some generic-like things, um, I, I still feel like having true generics built into the language would be a huge benefit for this too. Um, so yeah, that's my that's I think the missing piece that's missing in Go right now. Someone asked, "When is Go not a good idea?" <laughs> um, well, Go is not a good idea for, say, running code on the web browser. Um, JavaScript is definitely what you want to be running on your web browser in 2021. Um, that could change. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to choose Go. Um, why else not Go? Maybe no one on your team is experienced with Go. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's about what I can think of right now. Someone asked, do you use a package for error handling? One complaint I've read about Go is the constant error checking. Error is not equal to nil. Yeah, your example of reading the file had lots of error handling compared to the actual function. This is true. This is, a, uh, this is something of maybe semi-religious debate. <laughs> Um, error handling in Go is very explicit. And so you're constantly checking if error is not equal to nil, handle your error. And I think that the benefit of that is you're kind of forced to handle your errors. Um, you know, what is the, you're always thinking about the worst case scenario. And a good programmer, I think, is one who looks both ways when before he crosses a two-way street, you know, <clears throat> what's the worst case scenario that can happen uh, at this point in the code? So Go does not have a try-catch, uh, some of this actually said about there's There's no try-catch uh, syntax in Go. There is a panic recover mechanism, which is like try-catch, although it's more of a, you know, panic, something's really broken, you know, crash the program sort of, uh, type uh, mechanism. Generally, for errors, you're passing errors at return values to your function. So it really, I think that the error handling in Go, while it, it is a little bit, uh, it hurts writability, um, I think that the whole, like, constantly, if error not equal nil, blah, 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 it, it's not very fun to write. It kind of feels a little bit um, tedious, but it's, it's really nice to read. And that kind of goes back to readability versus writability. And Go leans more to readability. Because it's very explicit as to what's happening. Um, anyway, you can, yeah, there's there's all sorts of uh, religious discussions on the internet about Go error handling. But if you're using a REST service, how would you how would you handle logging? So Go has a very um, robust HTTP library. And there are all sorts of web frameworks out there for Go. Um, 
I recommend doing research on web frameworks before you choose one to see which one works well for you. But uh, you, there is, there are many web frameworks that specialize in creating REST services and things like that. Um, just like in Node.js, for example, you have Express and Koa. Um, and I'm trying to think of some of the web frameworks for C sharp um, or, or for the .NET uh, space. But anyway, um, these these sort of things exist in Go as well as libraries. You could also use a lot of the standard library. Uh, the, the HTTP library for those is pretty great, just in the standard library um, for simple things. But if you're building an entirely large REST service, um, I recommend using web frameworks. Does Go, does Go uh, is it able to be compiled to WebAssembly? That's a great question. Yes, um, Go can compile to WebAssembly. So technically, you can run Go in the browser. Um, would I recommend it at this point? Maybe. I think that every year it gets better. Um, there's also a special Go compiler called Tiny Go. And if you do a quick Google search on Tiny Go, you will find that uh, it's designed for microcontrollers. But they are also targeting WebAssembly. And um, yeah, uh, I think that maybe in a couple of years, uh, you know, you could run some Go in the browser. Obviously, you can do it now, you can do it. But, um, you know, there's no React for Go yet. React JS runs on JavaScript. So there's no like really nice, as far as I can tell, um, or at least the last time I looked. There's no really nice um, web component library for Go that runs under WebAssembly. But as soon as they have that, you know, I could definitely see people writing Go programs and compiling it into the browser. Yeah, most of it would just be WebAssembly. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Is nil function functionally the same as null, just a different word, or is it somehow different? Yeah. Um, there is no null in no, er, in Go. Um, <clears throat> it is called nil. It is pretty much the same as null. I think they just call it nil for a Maybe it's precision. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's one fewer character. So. <laughs> uh, someone asked, are there different tools available for Go? Um, I think I need to. I think I need you to elaborate a little bit more on that. you end up using a lot of external dependencies when building Go apps? <clears throat> um, a fair number. I mean, depend it obviously depends on what you're building. Um, but I would say, you know, at a bare minimum, you're going to be choosing two or three different, uh, two or three different dependencies. Um, one nice thing about Go is, at least not yet, I haven't seen this, um, but when you when you uh, import a particular dependency, usually that dependency only has zero or maybe one or two other dependencies. In Node.js, you could import a dependency and it could have you could be importing you know sixty megabytes of dependencies pretty easily. It's just insane, and you end up with this dependency problem of well, how can we ensure <laughs> that there's no virus or, or malicious code of some kind in one or more of our dependencies uh, and sub-dependencies and dependencies, you know, somewhere in that tree, in that dependency tree, how do we know that this is safe? And I think in Go, um, you know, at least not yet, uh, it's, it's pretty lean. In other words, people are pretty uh, nice to 
um, not have so many dependencies. Like to say, well, if I have to write 10 lines of code, instead of importing a dependency, I'll just write those 10 lines of code. Um, yeah, Go also has a debugger, which I think some, somebody has mentioned a few different times. Um, there are debuggers for Go. <clears throat> I've not really used them very much. Uh, I, I'm a more of a, a print line sort of debugger, uh, but everyone's a little different. Everyone programs differently. So if you prefer using a debugger, <clears throat> um, there are debuggers out there for Go and they're great. Um, and uh, VS Code has a Golang extension um, for Go. And that has debugging built in. Um, so thanks to uh, your office for mentioning that. Um, I don't know what resharper is exactly. Um, someone also mentioned awesomego.com, awesome-go.com. Um, let me just kind of pull that up here. But this is, uh, these are all of the Go projects that are awesome, right? So this is just like a continuous list of all sorts of libraries that you can, that are in Go. And here's, here's a huge list of full stack web frameworks from which you can choose. Um, obviously, some are more popular than others. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, there's no shortage of libraries. I'm trying to think what I've used. Oh, I've used this MUX router in the past. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of libraries to interact with databases, RM frameworks, um, email, you know, all sorts of different types of uh, libraries that you can, you can use. Um, as far as I know, in the Go package landscape, there's really no automated uh, virus scanning for vulnerable code yet. But that is something that the Go team is working hard on, is, is developing more of a repository of packages. Um, even though in Go you can import any GitHub repository, um, it would be nice to have, you know, a, a central repository of published packages. So yeah, they're working pretty hard on that right now. Um, that's kind of an important issue. Yeah, any other questions or thoughts? I don't think there's anything else to talk about. Um, okay, well, uh, Blake, first off, thank you very much. Uh, this was a really engaging one. Um, I can tell by the amount of participation and questions being asked and all of that. Uh, so again, thank you for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, to everyone who attended, thank you for being engaged and asking questions um, and all of that because uh, it always makes it easier on the presenter. So, uh, and of course, thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, feel free to tell your friends about this group and yeah. I think that'll about do it for tonight. So yeah, yeah thanks again.